today's talk, the, sub, the subtitle to that is, what was it? My travel. Something with travel. What is the subtitle for this talk? Yeah, I just want to be, you know, I have a tendency to ramble, so I try and do, to, to, to focus today. Uh, this is a travel, I think. So there's something to travel, I'm sure. Don't you? Oh, when you collect art, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, so really looking at the region, looking at Malaysia. Uh, when I first started, before I, when I first started collecting, I was a lawyer. Uh, uh, lucky to be a lawyer because they'd afford me the, 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 the ability to travel around South Asia. Uh, and then realized that I had, I had no idea about my backyard, absolutely no idea. I can tell you who the kings and queens of England are, but I don't know anything about southern Asia. So, as a lawyer, I started going to galleries. When I traveled around the, the, the cities of southern Asia, I went to galleries first, as a way to, you know, look at the region through the artist's eye. And, uh, in any collection, when you build a collection, there are two kind of limitations. The obvious one is obviously budget, right? The second one, less obvious, is space. We don't, when we buy a painting, sometimes we don't think, where is that going to go? When you buy it, it won't fit. Then it goes to storage. Uh, so those are the obvious limitations of the collection. But the other thing is if you work Malaysia, or female artists of Malaysia, or just photography, there's a lot of, depending on your budget and your space and your own interest itself. There's no hard and fast rule. Uh, for me, uh, it was looking at the region was very interesting. Uh, Malaysia was too small for me, uh, a bit parochial, uh, in terms of, of uh, many things. And then I, got, I traveled to Indonesia, to Philippines. Uh, what really interests me, looking at the region, was really how this region of 600 million people, uh, 200, 300 million in Muslims, another 150 million Catholics, and really, in the context of, of history, that is. And yet, somehow, either by guile or providence, we remain quite friendly. And what, did, what made that happen? What connected us? And I think looking through the artist's eyes give us some insight into what connects us and how we have survived as a region uh, over the post-colonial anyway. Um, OK, so really the region itself. Um, so I've been a, a dealer of Collector of Southern Asia for the last 30 years. Uh, I stopped dealing about five years ago, and I started traveling outside of, of Southern Asia. Uh, one of the first places was India, which I did uh, this year. And again, because Malaysia is, is, is a composition of 15% you know, Indian and 25% you know, Chinese, these will always be mother countries to a great portion of our population. It is important as Malaysians to also understand where that resonance comes from. Uh, so India became very fascinating for me. But you can't collect all Indians. I mean, you just don't have the budget. Uh, so I kind of looked at women artists. One of the guiding principles for, for me now, and I think hopefully for Ilham as well, is really try and redress this balance uh, of women artists in public collections. Uh, there's only 5% women artists in all museums around the world. 5%. You can't tell me there's no women artists. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's institutionalized prejudice and bias that's been there for hundreds of years. Nobody's really looked at it. So one of the things we try to redress in, the, in our collection is to redress that balance. In this show, uh, there are 43 artists, 19 of which are women. And not quite equal, but you know, it's working towards addressing 
that balance. Um, what else are the limitations we looked at? Okay, so what I do is I, I say, for instance, I'm just going to run through the places I've been to this year. Uh, as I look at art and as I collect art. Uh, the first place was I went to India, and there was an art fair, uh, just around Chinese New Year. Uh, uh, a cool weather, so if I, I haven't been to India like for 10 years at least. So it's completely changed when it was 10 years ago. They're a very good public transport system, a bit polluted, but so there is art fair, small art fair of about 50 to 60 galleries, 70% of which are uh, Indian galleries. So really good one stop. In a country of 1.2 billion, and you know, you're not going to go and see everything. So it's all in Delhi during this one week in, in Delhi. So I, I went and. Uh, it seems some of the things we looked at. This is a very senior Indian artist called Apita Singh. She's about 80 years old. Uh, this is basically the art fair itself. And this is Apita Singh. Uh, uh, I've known her for a number of years. She came to Bali for a month and I had to look after her. Uh, and she's, yeah, so she had a museum show in New Delhi when I went to see her. A very, very senior artist. And this is Silpa Gupta. And her work, we have two works here. Mm -hmm. She's essentially a conceptual artist. Her works really look at agenda issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other day before I'll stop there, uh, because within, say, Southeast Asia, you can collect goldfish paintings, you can collect landscape, you can collect whatever. There's no right and wrong. Uh, what I've done is basically try to narrow that down to uh, issues that I, I kind of look at things. See, I, I go to museums a lot. I say to myself, what would a museum look like 100 years from now? What are the audience looking for in the art of 100 years ago that will resonate with them? I mean, the obvious ones are obviously the environment. How much have we address and taking steps? And how has artists contributed to that conversation? The second one, obviously, have we been fair to our women? So gender issues become hugely important. So I find art that deals with those issues. Obviously, the other issues are, of course, identity, whether it's national or personal. Uh, politics is important. Uh, so you find those are the themes within the shows. OK, so always kind of, I don't want to be accused of having poverty of ambition, but there is limits. You know, you, you, you want to be able to focus and focus uh, on something that hopefully will endure 100 years from now. Uh, so India, and it's Shilpa Gupta, uh, a conceptual artist, a lot of work really deals with the with, uh, uh, concept of women's issues. And, uh, this is an Indian artist, a male artist, and that's a self-portrait. This is a cutout. So it basically like 100 layers of paper they're almost three-dimensional. The small one, they're meta. Uh, just, you know, I, you know, people always remember numbers in terms, especially as millions of dollars. This is, this artist called Tia Meta, uh, the early modernist Indian artist, he's painting for upwards of mm -hmm. two million US. If you can get it, just to give you a, a uh, this is a, a, a seminal Indian artist. I uh, can't remember her name now. What was her name? Uh, Amrita Shergill. That's her name. This is uh, photographed by her father. She was half German, half Indian. Do you consider one of the masters of Indian art? And this is M.F. Hussein, because another Indian master. So these are the things I saw at the art fair, that you can buy at the art fair if that's what you're looking at. This is uh, Anju Dodia. We have two of her works here. Uh, 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 female artists, a lot of works again to do with gender issues and, and women rights. And this is Mitu Sen. We have some drawings at the back there of her. Again, a female artist. Very subversive. Uh, 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 it, it's borderline uh, 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 
uh, censorable. I mean, a lot of the work, I mean, I had, worked, I had bought works that I couldn't send back by mail because the, the shipper said we will be stopped. So I had, to, I had to go there and pick it up myself or have somebody bring it over. And this is her. She's uh, one of the artists who's coming to talk, I think, on the 7th of September. She's coming here to do a talk about her, her art in particular. And this is Anju Dodia and her husband Atul Dodia. And one of the nice things about collecting contemporary art is most of the artists are still alive. And people were asking me, do you read about the artists or, or, or how do you find out whether who's good? You can't get better than the artist. Yeah, so I make a point of meeting artists as much as I can. I keep in touch. I've known this couple for a long time, all three of them quite a number of times. Even though I didn't collect their art, there was always a conversation. Uh, yeah, so I mean, if you, I mean, you know, dead artists, you know, you, you have to read people's ideas of them. With, 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 with living artists, you, you can go and ask them. They're more than happy to be, too. Uh, also meet your son. So come for her talk on the 7th. Uh, Andrew Dodia. You see, my, my eye, we can't just follow. This is, I just, I mean, in each place I go to, I take thousands of photographs. I just, I have, for brevity of time, reduced to about 30 maximum for each venue. So you can see where, what I'm collecting, women. Uh, uh, and this is one of the things I've noticed, uh, uh, not just in India, but really the return of textile art as a means of expression, and oftentimes by women. And apart from the fact that it's working with your hands, uh, I come from a tribal society where, say, Dayak, there's no, there's, no, there's no written, we have no written language. So the historian in our, in our longhouses were the weavers. They weave blankets that tells our mythology, our cosmology, our values. Uh, so that kind of resonated with me, that people, artists, contemporary artists, are, are returning to really tactile, hands-on, working with the hand because it's, you know, it, it's telling a story. Uh, so this is a, a, a embroidery. This is another embroidery. In an art fair, this is not something that you would see in art fair. This would be more in an arts and craft places. But these are all signed pieces. These are pieces done by artists who's composed it and more often not actually embroidered themselves. And this is a huge piece, white on white. It's a technique called chikaneri, well known in Lucknow. And this woman, she's 80 years old. This is large, this is a, a six foot. It's white and white. Incredibly detailed. And that's her on the left with me. She's 80 years old. She designed the whole thing, supervised it with 30 men embroidering for her. I love that idea of this woman artist who signs the name to it, but I know she's fact it is 30 men slaving over a sweatshop. This is that artist who did the... So these are the things we bought. This is something I bought because, it, again, it's, it's, about, it's about the environment and it's by a, a, a female artist. And that's her. Did that weighs... How many tons was that she too? Yeah, it's heavy. It's at the back of that wall there with some of her drawings. And this is uh, another artist we, we, we looked at, uh, Madhu Devan from South India. Uh, a portrait of, this is a, uh, in India, caste is still very much part of, of everyday life. And he was one of the politicians, or kind of activists in the South, who was really trying to break that down. Uh, so, a lot of, you know, he's seen as a hero to many of the untouchables. I mean, you know, we may, in most of South Asia, we don't have caste so much as, as class and economic. It's the same. It's, it's a divide. It's an artificial construct that divides people, whether it is through money or through, you know, caste. Uh, so while we don't have a caste system in Malaysia or Singapore or Philippines, what divides us is economics, which is perhaps more powerful than... than, than 
Yeah, it's a very long name. Sudhir Patwadan is a, 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 from Kerala. Uh, this role. But this is uh, the, the man next to me is uh, uh, Jitesh Kalat, and his wife, the glamorous lady next to uh, uh, Karim. Uh, she, did, she has that work with the peacock, which deals with the issue of Pakistan and India, very topical at this moment. Uh, that's her, uh, the husband and wife. He's, he's a huge uh, artist in, 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 I mean, around the world now. Uh, he first came to Malaysia at my invitation, I think in, I can't remember when it was, he came to give a talk about Indian art. Uh, this is the work I, we bought. This is a, a, a Bangladeshi. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a, a, an artist from Nepal. It's all about refugees and migrants and, and life jackets. And, yeah, two of the works are here. Again, uh, 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 an issue that generations to come will look at. How have we treated uh, refugees? So, the, so January was, 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 was Delhi. And then uh, February, there's an art fair every year called Art Fair Philippines. There are a number of art fairs, but this is the main one. Uh, so in Manila, so I was in February in Manila. Uh, some of the works we looked at and bought. This is Roberto Faleo. Two of the works are here. So there's that whole section that really looks at portraiture and identity. I mean, this will always be issues as we move forward. And that's, it's a perennial issue for, for all civilizations. Uh, this is a young Filipino artist who explored the idea of, a young woman, a lady artist, uh, explored the idea of painting. So she kind of uh, painted each painting. These are all little paintings. And then she composed it and did a slow-mo of each one, how she painted and how she created it. This is another artist, young artist, uh, video artist. She created a, a whole environment. It's really just egg white, beaten egg white on a back stream, in the tropics obviously, but it looks like an iceberg. Uh, young artist, uh, uh, and this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is an artist, they, they did this wings, Filipino again, the, the, the left wing, this is a couple, and then there's this massive, massive city made out of cardboard boxes. To, to give an idea of urbanization as, again, one of the central issues of contemporary society. How we live cheek by jowl, uh, 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 oftentimes precariously, uh, uh, given the, the environmental... Uh, and this is massive. This is massive. Yeah, I'll have a view of it later. So this is the detail of it. I, don't know, I, didn't, I didn't include it, but it's massive. This, this, these are all the things we... Kind of, these are two young artists, both her work, Nona, she's, her work is the chandelier at the back, the broken chandelier at the back. And also in, 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 in Manila this year, there was a booth selling Botero, and one sold for 1.9 million, which you could have bought the entire fair for, with that one Botero. Uh, this is Jared and Javier, Tony, uh, these are some more artists. And then we also, just by chance, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we found four little paintings by a, a Filipino master called Jerry Navarro. And all of them from very key periods of his, of his, uh, uh, his, his, his career. Uh, Jerry Navarro is really quite important. He's, he's, in the Philippines, they have this thing called a national artist. I mean, you get a national artist, you don't get money, you get state funeral, right? Uh, so they have state, they have national artists for poetry, for film, for fashion, for, so it's a big deal. Uh, uh, so he's the national artist. Uh, uh, so we were able to acquire four, this is early, 1951. And you look at some of his, these are, then he moved on to very conceptual work. So it's really interesting. You don't have to necessarily buy big, big work for it to be important or for it to be meaningful. Yeah? Oftentimes it's small ones. One of my favorite things to collect is sketchbooks. 
little drawings that artists throw away. You know, because I have no... I'm not an artist, so I will never be an artist. So, you know, buying sketches bring me as close as possible to the creative process. And I always like the idea of, of just, you know, I have things that artists have thrown away. This is uh, Jerry Navarro. Mm -hmm. This is a young uh, uh, painter from the Philippines. Ivan Open, big hit, not my favorite thing, but uh, a huge hit. Sometimes, sometimes I am a bit naughty. I look at things, I think, that's underpriced. If I buy that now, in five years' time, I can sell it for 10 times. Sometimes you just buy it for that, because you know you can make money, and then can, it can then get you to buy other things that you really want. I mean, I did it, I remember when the Chinese contemporary art came into, tell me when I'm digressing, but you know, when I was looking at art, Chinese art very early on in the late, late 80s, I think, or early 90s, I was in Hong Kong and I saw this exhibition of little of the drawing, but all, you know, subsequently it became very famous. Uh, artists, Ye Ming Jun, Fang Li Jun, they're all like 2,000 US dollars each. So I bought 10 of them. All the different artists. I've sold each one as I needed, when I have needed money, I sold one. And they, they were averaging about, by the time I sold, about 60, 70,000 each. So I, sometimes I don't buy it because I like them. Well, I did like them, but I also knew in my gut that this will make me money. So this is one of those. This is Agusso, I guess. And usually, uh, when I touched the gallery, it, it, Steve will vouch for this, Steve Wong was here. Uh, from my early days, above my gallery name was my name, and underneath it was Southeast Asia. I never confined myself to Southeast from Malaysia from day one. You know, I like to see myself as a part of a 600 million people rather than 30 million. You know, their culture is as much mine, and if it's not mine, then I'll make it mine. Uh, Agusawage, who I've shown here, a very famous artist. This is his first time he's showing in Manila this year. So it's nice to see, you know, they're finally catching up. That, you know, your neighbor's work mm -hmm. can sometimes be more interesting, and oftentimes cheaper. You know. This is a, a, a sculpture, big sculpture. A Filipino artist. This is, uh, so I, you know, when I go to cities, uh, uh, I always pop by to museums, art galleries, museums, you know, artist studio. So this was actually uh, in the Ateneo University Museum of Art. This is a painting by Pierre Dasa, a Malaysian, and it's really nice to see it in, in the museum collection. And he, was, he gave it to the museum. This is the director of the Ateneo. Boots, Boots Herrera was here 15 years ago working at the National Gallery as a volunteer, or did one year. So she's now head of the museum in Ateneo. But this is a young artist called Annette Skinnard. So this is now I'm visiting private galleries in Finale, and I bought, uh, I think, three or four of this. This is another young artist, photographer, this is Manuel Ocampo. Why I Hate Europeans is the title of the painting. Uh, he was one of the earliest kind of uh, uh, Filipino artists to make it big, firstly in, in, in America and later in Europe. Uh, he took part in, in, he was in, I think, Documenta in 1990, uh, where he had Nazi signs and Jesus Christ and cockroaches and totally kind of, I call it the school of ugly, because it is very ugly, but it, it's, it's not there to, 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 to be hung on your wall. It's there to make a statement. So he's really a deeply important artist, uh, Filipino. And since his return, he's kind of lived in America, Europe, and in the last 10 years, he's moved back to the Philippines and had a huge impact on the young art scene there. So a lot of would-be pseudo Manuel Ocampo there. Uh, so I told him, like, you started a school of ugly, uh, which he doesn't mind. And he's one of the artists who says, Valentine, don't be precious. My painting is not precious. He would say, roll them up. If there are cracks, that's the life of the painting. That adds to the history of that painting. Don't, it's not precious. It may be 20,000 US dollars, but in real value, it really, you want the painting to have a life. 
And this is a Thai artist. So you know, I'm putting some of these out. These are things I found in the Philippines art fair. So you know, we get to a point where the, the, the small capitals of the region are becoming more aware of what's happening around the world. A lot of it's because of the internet. Yeah. So this is a Thai artist called Rikrit. Rikrit, the last name I can't really pronounce. But uh, big, uh, you know, he cooks as part of his performance. And this is a newspaper uh, where he, he puts writings on it. This is the couple. So, then, you know, I'm not showing this because I'm showing off. I just want you all to know, it's very, you know, we live in very interesting time. If you're collecting, go and see the artists. Talk to artists, make friends with them, because that's the best way, not reading, you know, essays that you need a dictionary next to you to understand. You want to go and talk to these artists. They, you know, they don't, they don't expect you to talk deeply about theory. Okay, they like you talk normally. It's very important to keep in touch with, that's the couple, left, and uh, Isabel and Freddie, they did the wings. Yeah, and that's Nona Garcia, who did the chandelier at the back. Uh, this is kind of, you know, history of Southeast Asia is being constantly rewritten, yeah? In, in, in 10 years' time, there'll be artists we discovered who, who was painting now that nobody took a look at. This is one of those artists in the Philippines, Ray Albano. Uh, uh, overlooked, conceptual, intellectual, but nobody looks at his work. I've been collecting them for the last 10 years. Uh, you know, the scraps of paper, because I've read his writing. This is a guy with, 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 with knowledge of, of American art history, and you know. And these are, these are works from the 60s. The Shape of Gold, these series of paintings are called. And this is a young, uh, another young uh, Filipino uh, lady artist. And what it is, is basically, one is a painted and one is embroidered. So the left is a painting. Again, back to this idea of working with your hands. Giving meaning to the work that you do with your hands. Jimmy Ong, who is here, he started a project where he's stitching together a lot of denim in Jogja recently. So again, working with the hand. So art is not necessarily about painting or drawing. Or, there's many, many ways to express yourself. And it's really interesting how, I think, the idea of using your hand in, in, in embroidery and, and stitching uh, has, has come back. And this is Ray Albano. What's interesting about the Philippines is, when I was growing up, Philippines was seen as the center of Southeast. It was sophisticated. It had film festival. It had art museums. It had the cultural center of the Philippines. All because really of Melda Marcos. In fairness, uh, she had an international view of herself. She didn't want to be a provincial beauty queen. She wanted to be on the world stage. Uh, she and she took the arts with her. And this is a, a, a poster for a play called uh, uh, "Waiting for Godot," one of the seminal works of of world literature, yeah. And this was shown two years after the premiere of that play in Paris, in Manila, of all places. That gives you an idea. I mean, we often, you know, one of the things I do, because I travel, I go, I spend a lot of time in Indonesia. When I come back here, when I tell my friend, and I speak with the Indonesian accent sometimes, they can say, well, why do you speak like that? Uh, uh, we have this prejudice against our neighbors because they work as our drivers, or because they work as our servants, or they work as a gardener. Uh, mm -hmm. It happens, you know, uh, very common. I see it in Singapore a lot, I see it here a lot. Uh, Padahal, as the Indonesian would say, our culture is much more sophisticated, much more halus, you know. The measure of civilization isn't how will your GDP I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you know, oftentimes you kind of, uh, you know, Filipinos were way, way ahead of us. Uh, uh, sometimes we have to remember that. I mean, given the Marcos and all that, but you know, there, there were. This is again uh, Shilpa Gupta. I saw this show in Manila. This is a show I saw in Manila. So she did basically did the same thing where she got people. This is different cities. I think it's Toronto, and then she got people there to draw the map of that city from memory. 
And this is that big thing, the Achillesian thing. This is humongous. That's one person there, yeah? So it's built into a cone shape. It's basically a cardboard city. Uh, this is in a museum, a uh, metropolitan museum. This was a painting I sold 20 years ago to the Metropolitan Museum, to a collector in the Philippines. I had this show on Philippine art, and basically I, I, I sold this to a collector who gave it to the Metropolitan Museum. It's become one of the, uh, I mean, you know. This is another series of paintings I, I sold to the Metropolitan. So the next fair was in March, Hong Kong. Okay. Hong Kong, you go, I mean, one of the, the only two, three fairs that I go to now, uh, one is at Basel. At Basel, because that's where the world congregates. So you can see the best Botero, if that's what you want. You can see, you know, uh, uh, so it's international. So I go to that to see what the rest of the world is doing and buying. Uh, And this is some of the things we saw and bought. This is Anju Dodia, what is up here. And this is a great, great uh, Pakistani lady uh, artist called Adila, Adila Suleiman. It's deeply violent, it's all to do with kind of, against, you know, the, the, you know violence and terrorism and, and, and this is, it's, these are kind of, you know, recurring themes in the 20th, 21st century. Uh, 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 and artists have dealt with it. it you know, even from afar, they, they're beautifully executed. I mean, they're like miniatures. When you go closer, they're uh, bloodletting. And the same artists. So you can get this. It's a Spanish artist, Manola Valdez. It's a kind of bronze sculpture. Uh, uh, the things you can buy in Hong Kong, with, with, yeah, and, and this is basically uh, based on Les Meninas, one of the girls in Les Meninas by Velasquez. Uh, uh, kind of you know, iconic painting, so he's kind of made of bronze out of it. This is quite large. Uh, but the kind of things you can sell, this is Heredono, whose work is there with the puppet. He you kind of very important Indonesian artist, one of the early to break out of Indonesia, have an Indonesian, uh, uh, have an international profile. And not because he's a great painter, because he's a, he's a satire. His works are very badly made, because they're made out of kind of like leathers and strings and things, in very low tech. But Java is low tech. Of course, you can get Giorgio Morandi, if that's what you like, which I love, but you, can't, you can never afford. Uh, so I always take pictures, so, and this is the Cezanne, and this is in Hong Kong, and called Cindy Sherman. So, you, I mean, you get to see uh, international art that are available in Hong Kong. Uh, and this is uh, Louis Bourgeois, made out of pink marble. This is also Louis Bourgeois. They'll go for about two million US a piece, I asked. And this is uh, Augusto Wage in Hong Kong, so this is in his booth. And that proudly is Adeline Uy, who was, uh, used to work for me, now runs the Art Basel Hong Kong, the lady next to me. And that's the dealer from Hong Kong, uh, from Mumbai. This is really interesting now in terms of what's happening in Kashmir. This is the same lady who did the peacock. Her, her work is all about uh, uh, borders and boundaries, whether it is personal boundaries, national boundaries, and then how to cross this perilous boundary, often lined with, with barbed wire. This is a work that deals with different borders. The top drawing is basically the borders between China and Pakistan, and that's the border between uh, 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 India and China, and then there's a border with Pakistan and India. So, you know, in the light of what's happening in Kashmir, I should have bought this, really, but I didn't buy it. I, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's, and accompanying it is basically, uh, so those are the kind of lines drawn, essentially barbed wire, pencil drawn, and this side is kind of like pictures of the location where the, where the line crossed. This is that work. A Cambodian artist. 
the work often relate to the environment. I mean, you know, my reading, which is not necessarily the wrong, this really represents a lung, except it's no longer green. The same artist. So we had a choice between that and this, and that was, I thought, the stronger piece was that. Uh, if I'm kind of buying for, for, for museums and public collections, one of the things I look for is, uh, you're going to hate me for this, what's Instagrammable? Because the best way to, 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 to reach to bigger audience, to reuse the resources you have now. What are the young people, what medium are they using, whether it's TikTok, whether it's WeChat, whether it's Instagram. I don't care. Just get it out there, get people in minutes. And if it's a great piece of work, they will photograph it and share it. That means 10 more people will see it. Or do I care if you take a picture? Oftentimes, I always also insist that the pictures are not reflective. It takes a better picture. It's not as good for the painting than, the, than a reflective one, but really, you know, you want to spread the word. And the, 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 you, make that, you want to make that as easy as possible for people to share. I don't want, if you take a nice paint, big, bad picture of a good painting, you don't want to share it, because it says something about you as well. You're not a good photographer, or you know, do you really know what you're talking about? If you really like something, you want to take a photo, and you want to make sure you cut it properly, it's all, you know. Anyway, this is uh, another, this is Manuel Alcampo, the Filipino again. This is all in Hong Kong, yeah? So remember, you're in Asia, but you're looking at international art. This is that work that we bought. One of the things we did with this show is really kind of, we have a workshop uh, of, of, uh, of uh, art writing. Yeah? So we had, a, a, led by Wang Choi, who's a, one of our top critics and, and writers on, on art. And he led a workshop, selected 10 young writers to write. And all the wall texts are written by, by these 10 young artists. One of the, the, the things about the art in the region is, yeah, I can count on one hand the number of writers who write well on art. Which, you know, you, you need the whole gamut. You need art galleries, you need artists, obviously, you need writers, and you need collectors, and you need institutions. We are all essential part of that ecosystem. One can, you know, we, the whole thing will not exist we don't have. And we, you know, we all each have a role to play in that. This is a, a, a Indian artist based in Africa. It's all these old ceramics. Can't remember the name, but. This is by our Malaysian artist, uh, uh, Ilan Yi. She's now back in Sabah working with uh, uh, Communities, women in, in different villages who have different ways of weaving, who weave different ways. That's the first work in this series which did, which we bought, called Tana Ayer, which basically means homeland in Malay, but the literal translation is land and water, which, you know, in Malay means homeland. This is a, so it's weaving. This was shown in Hong Kong. And this is uh, one of Indonesia's most successful mm -hmm. artists, uh, uh, value, uh, money wise. Yeah, Masriadi. So his painting goes for upwards of 250,000. We have one of them here, a self-portrait, the big wave. Uh, this is uh, an artist from Chiang Mai. As you come into the entrance, there's all those cut out kind of things falling out. So this is the artist, uh, uh, Mit Jayen. Conceptual artist, he paints, he cuts them up, and then he lets you put it up. This is where, you know, taking the idea of anybody can be an artist to, 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 you know, to an extreme. But he was very happy. I, I took a photo of, he loved it. He said, oh, that's perfect. I don't want to change a thing. Who did, well, Karen did it, one of the interns. Did it. This is another 80-year-old uh, Pakistani woman. Uh, her name is Zarina. Uh, essentially a printmaker. Uh, she's 80 this year, and just now been discovered. 
Uh, and she makes all these beautiful drawings of airplanes and kind of, you know, for a you new, know, I imagine a fragile little woman in a New York apartment and she's drawing all these weapons of mass destruction. It's something like, something about that. There's Arena. Mm -hmm. Inventory of destruction. It was sold by the time I got to it. There was a series of five. They were like 5,000 US dollars a piece. It was sold to a museum, so I'm happy. Uh, this is Francis Bacon, something you would see in Hong Kong. So it was in, during the Hong Kong art fair, uh, Basel art fair, there's also the auctions. So all the new, Christie's and stuff bring all their top pieces, of the big castles in there. So this is the Francis Bacon that was shown during the preview. So you pop in and see, you're never gonna see one in Hong Kong, so you go and see it in the auction preview. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Kuning. These are all uh, estimates above 20 million USD. Just to give you an idea, this is a Rothko that was valued at 50 million. They had the guard on either side of that painting. And they limit like five people each time to go stand in front of it, as if it was a god. This is surprising. You walk around Hong Kong Mall. This is, I don't know anybody in Australia, but there's a famous Australian artist called Sidney Nolan, who is famous for painting this man with the kind of iron mask. And he was commissioned to do this series of landscapes, pretty landscapes, uh, in a Hong Kong building, I think. Yeah, like a series of 20 of them, it's surprising. I mean, you know, I don't think anybody knew about them. I don't think he's particularly proud of them. They're very pretty, too pretty for his career. And then the next thing was Bangkok. I think, you know, the, 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 apart from being able to buy, you, you also want to go to places where there's nothing for sale. The pressure then is, oh, you don't have, there's nothing for sale, so great, you can just enjoy the work for what it is. You're not rushing, oh God, I missed it. Somebody else got it before me. So going to Biennale is very important. Biennale is basically, you know, Biennale is what it says. Every two years, each city will have their own art festival. Oftentimes, it's international. Uh, uh, this year, uh, I can't remember what month it was, Bangkok had its first one. Yeah, Bangkok Opera, curated by a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, so I went for that, there was nothing for sale. Uh, one of the things of when you go to Biennale, because Biennale, Biennale is treated as kind of really serious uh, 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 forum of, of, of what concerns our contemporary artists today. Because it's, it, you, know, you take away the, 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 the cloy of money it's, it, it's, it's, you know, you get people going in Syria, there's nothing for sale, we're here because we love it. Uh, but it's very important as a collector to go to these places because you see, because in the Biennale, unlike an art fair where you have to paint a certain size to fit a certain wall because the wall costs money, in the Biennale you're given sometimes an entire room. So your scale, you can make big, big things and not worry about selling it because somebody's already paid you to make it. So it, it, it gives you a sense of the artist's ambition. Yeah. What you don't want is to have an, an artist with the poverty of ambition or poverty of vision. You want an artist who, given the opportunity, will grow, will rise to the occasion, take over an entire factory. And I, I like those artists, and, when they, and, and you go and see them, and you say, wow. The next time you go to the art fair, you say, oh yeah, I remember this girl. She did a huge factory in Kochi. And there's a little drawing, and you want to buy it, because she's taken seriously. And it's likely to endure, then not endure. These are all bets, by the way. There's no 100% guarantee. Yeah. So this is a Thai artist who basically uses her hair. So she weaves her hair. So all this lines is her hair. This is a video by a, this is, this is the Biennale, there's nothing for sale. So things like videos, uh, installations are very prominent in, in Biennale because it's not for sale. So this is the Russian artist that looks at the future. It's a very haunting and actually beautiful video. I kept going back to it. One of the best things I saw in Bangkok. It's not something we will ever buy because it falls with it outside of our, our ambit of collecting. But even so, you know, you, 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 you want to learn. 
And this is a Thai artist. Video. Is that it? This very short, okay. This is the same artist who everything is made with her own hair. So she weaves them into objects and then. Uh, this is uh, uh, another woman artist from, from southern Thailand, Pattaya. Uh, woven, again woven, this is all the jute that's woven into an installation. Then you have this, of course. Yeah, so this is a big, big, uh, uh, what's the name of the artist again? Japanese artist. Yes, I, you know, you know. Uh, Nara, Nara, the comet, yeah. This Thai artist, Nati Uttarit, in the Biennale. And this is uh, Francisco Clemente, New York artist, also in the Bangkok Biennale. This is a Japanese artist, I think. And this is Dragon of the M screen, the kind of, uh, Scandinavian uh, conceptual artist. Uh, this is, a, I thought it was a swimming pool. Uh, with the diving board, it turned out it was the kind of computer switch on. This is a painting uh, of a Papua girl. This is, it belonged to me and it was borrowed by the Biennale as part of an exhibition. It's all about marginalized communities, indigenous communities that have been marginalized. Moliono. This is uh, uh, inside the temple. They've installed the work of Monten Bumna, perhaps one of the greatest installation artists, not just in Asia, but the world. Uh, uh, we have one of the work here, the black question on the floor. This is a series of structures that essentially is like a personal temple. You stand, you go underneath, and you stand inside that structure and meditate. This is Tawachai. Tawachai is the, uh, an artist who used to work as an assistant to Montien. He used to make all the works. Mon they, they, they were in, and, and he's the one who did this work. You know, all about perception and, and, and unbalance. His, his work makes you unbalanced, challenges you, your center of gravity, which we need sometimes. This is, of course, Yare Kusama, who is in every art fair. This is not, this, he was, she, that's the Bangkok Biennale. Yeah, so. And then the next thing was, the next thing I went to was Kochi. When was that? I think, uh, anyway, Kochi is one of the uh, newest Biennales in, in Asia. Uh, it's in, 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 in the South India. It's very, very beautiful. And usually it's predominantly Christian. So you see, the Virgin Mary and crucifix in every street corner, almost like it's Philippines, except it's India. Uh, and also, 98% literacy rate. It has the highest literacy rate in the whole of India. 98% are literate. And has been run by a communist government since independence. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and so they had started this Biennale there. And very community-based. Uh, uh, so. Uh, this is the third or fourth one, I think. So I went on, a, on three day visits just to see it, and it did not disappoint. Yeah, so Marlene Dumas, they had things like, oh, no, no, this is not the Marlene Dumas. This is a, a, a South African artist, William Kentridge. A huge installation. The great thing about, like I said, I want to repeat this again, go to Biennale because there's, you can't buy anything. So you can just enjoy the art for it, what it is. Yeah, so it's a, this is a, a, a beaut, I think one of the most beautiful things I've seen this year. It's an installation of sound. Basically there are hundred, this artist, Shilpa Gupta, who did the, 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 the maps of India and the, the, the x-ray, she did this room, darkened room, with a hundred speakers, like this, hanging, suspended, and a piece of poetry that stabbed to a lectern. And, all, and these are all poets for the last thousand years who have been silenced, 
whose work has been silenced, whose work has been they've, been, they've been killed and jailed because of their writing. And in each of the speaker is the reading in the original text of what's on the table, which is tab with a knife. It's one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. And this, after Kochi, went to Venice Biennale. And it's one of the kind of uh, most talked about installation in Venice. This is Marlene Duma, Belgian artist who, who uh, don't have to say, I mean, she is very, very special. One of the things I, I, I also, also in, 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 in Kochi was this uh, group called Guerrilla Girls. They've been around for a long time. They, essentially, you don't know who they are. They're just a group of women who just, whose work is to make you remember that women have had a raw deal for the last, since forever, as far as they are, I mean, and, and especially in the art world. So she, they all come up with statistics, like only 5% of women artists are represented in, in, in museum collection anywhere in the world. And a lot of the, the, you know, a lot of women that are in museum are naked women, because the men have objectivized and used women as models, but that's not painted by women. So this is the kind of issue that they bring up, just using their text, using statistics to bring up to highlight and point out to us injustices, unfairness, biases, and what have you. Not something you can buy. But, you know, sometimes the role of artists is just to remind us. And again, one of their works. You know, using sexy bodies and say, you know, we give them their starting roles, but you basically still objectivize them. Uh, this is, I don't know what that was, this is Anju Dodia again, one of our favorite art, Indian artists. This is her work also. Also her work. So she, she, that's her in front. So she pulls and puts herself with historical art figures in this series. That's, of course, Gertrude Stein. <coughs> Look at them, Kendra, the, 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 the thing all in. Let me shake. In, in South India, a lot of women uh, work as nurses in the Middle East. So this whole series of paintings is really about that, about how a lot of Indian nurses were sent out to the Middle East. And as a result, a lot of hospitals in, in, in India are short of staff, because they can't afford to pay the same amount as Shilpa Gupta. This is that installation with the poets. 100 poets whose voice have been silenced, either through murder, through execution. Uh, and this is Heridono in the, in the Coche Biennale. Very low tech, and his angels. Pang Rok Sulap, Malaysian group, in, 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 in Coche Biennale, and they took over an entire factory. And they always, whenever they go, they're a group of seven or eight young kids from right now in the, in the backwaters of Sabah, where I'm from. Uh, and they do kind of ply, uh, plywood etchings and they get people to step on it. And, kind of, and every place they go to, they, they make new works, like this one, making Kochi great. And they give it, to, give it away. See, they took over an entire warehouse. That's their work there, the two big works. On the side. Uh, this is a, a, an artist who is a total revelation to me. I've never heard of her until I went to India. Uh, uh, her, her work is made out of, she, she makes sculptures out of jute. Again, back to this, you know, tactile thing. And she's since passed away, but, you know, uh, I saw this show that they put up in the museum, and that show is now at the at MoMA, Metropolitan, Metropolitan, yeah, at yeah, the Metropolitan. Absolutely beautiful. They're dark, forbidding. Jitish Kalat is the, did this one, which he made up this fossilized things you know, of a civilization that might have been or will be.
And the last stop was Jogja. This was just about two weeks ago. Jogja, uh, uh, where I used to have a gallery, it's really the center of, fair to say, I think, the center of Indonesian contemporary art, uh, uh, followed closely by Bandung. Uh, I used to have people ask me what's the difference between Bandung and, and Jogja. Uh, Jogja artists who create with their heart. Bandung artists create with their heads. I would say Bandung artists are very conceptual, very cerebral. It's all about ideas and concepts. Whereas, you know, Jogja is all about painting my emotion, painting my, you know, uh, it, it's probably a, a very broad generalization, but it, I think, you know, fairly accurate. It, it, and, and Jogja, I, 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 I love. You, know, you throw a stone, there's, you hit an artist. Uh, uh, and you imagine Jogja, I mean Indonesia is 250 million people, right? And you are, say, a very talented kid in Aceh or in Bukitinggi or in Sulawesi. And, you know, you have the gift of drawing. Your parents can see it. You're a really good artist. Where do you want to go to study the further? It's always, always Jogja. There's a, there's a school there called Institute Sunni Indonesia, where they teach you all about ceramics, filmmaking, dance. So all the creative people go to Jogja to study. Uh, 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 and what happens is, when they graduate, they don't go back to Sulawesi or Aceh to become painter and sell their paintings because they're not going to make a living there. They're going to go back and become farmers or fishermen, like their fathers will. So what they do is they stay on, where they can struggle. They have friends from Sulawesi who cannot pay rent next month. He's in the same boat. So there's a camaraderie, there's a kind of commonality of, you know, there's a shared... I love Georgia. It's not the prettiest town in the world, but it, it, there's a community there. Uh, that's unique in, 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 in Asia. I mean, literally, I say when you throw a stone, you will hit an artist, more like not. They will stay on because uh, uh, if anything, they'll find, if you're gonna find a market at all, they're more likely to find it in Jogja than in, in, in back of Aceh or, or, or Antalo, right? So you will stay in Jogja because people like us go there and look at it. Uh, uh, so Jogja is very special. I just was just there. And they have this thing which started about 12 years ago called Art Jog, uh, uh, which is unique in the sense that it's an art fair. But it is not run by galleries and, 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 and con men. It, it, it's run by artists entirely. So artists run it. They make the sales, they, they, they invite artists. So this started 12 years. I remember I, 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 I wrote the first. Uh, a catalog for that, and it's, it's so unique. No galleries were allowed. You know, so each they will select maybe 20, 30. It started with like 30 artists, and each one was given a booth, and you make what you want, and you give the price list. We'll have little girls running around with prices for you. It's totally unique, and so they, it's now in its 12th year. But because the economy has been so bad for the art world in Indonesia for the last 10 years, since the, the, the 2009, uh, the market essentially has collapsed in Indonesia. Yeah? So uh, it's, it's good and bad, mainly because it, it takes out all the hype, takes out all the speculation which was rampant during its peak. Uh, and then hopefully the serious artists who are committed to the art will stay whatever whether they can sell a painting or not, because you know, a true artist will always remain an artist. It's like you and I breathing. They cannot not create. Uh, so what's happened in the last two years is they've not been able to sell very much. Uh, uh, so I mean, which is the reason why they did it in the first place, to have direct contact between the artist and the buyer without the intermediary of a dealer or a glamorous, you know, Gallerista. Uh, so it, it's a really good idea, except the market fell, completely collapsed. So the last two years, they've had to seek money from the government. Uh, obviously, as, as it's public money, uh, uh, 
they cannot also be too commercial. So they, be, they grew quite ambitious. So in sense, they commissioned works, huge works. So this is like 30 artists doing huge, huge work, like as if it was a Biennale. It wasn't like an art fair anymore, it's a Biennale. So, except it's every year now. So it, it, this, is, this is an Indian artist called Handy Wehrman. He dug a huge hole in front of the museum and planted things, uh, essentially kind of plastic and odd object. This is a huge hole, four meter hole in front of the museum he dug up. You can't buy that. <laughs> and a huge huge installation like this, this is another one, all bamboo in the whole room of bamboo and banana leaves. This is another kind of installation. You walk through. This artist has made this tunnel as if it was a fish trap. So you walk through it as if as you were a fish walking through it. It's a long tunnel. It's actually very, very beautiful. Made by a very senior artist called uh, uh, Sonario, who has a museum in, 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 in Bandung. Essentially reviving, he began to use craftsmen, people who, who weave bamboo. He invited them to make this. This is another, another uh, artist, and they're all to do with the sea environment. So this is actually a very beautiful video. This is a, a young artist who painted a series of little drawings called 30 Women from Java. The little, little paintings. Because this is, yeah, uh, uh, a portrait of the president of Indonesia. In a, you know, uh, basically this is a famous painting post. There's a, a famous artist in Indonesia called Suju Jono, and he did this, painting of himself separate, where he's holding a paintbrush and a paint, uh, and stating this is, this is who I am. I paint, therefore I exist. Uh, uh, the, the artist did it with the president. You're saying, it's really a good painting, but a bit derivative, but you know, it's, it's what it, you can buy. It's all about political symbols. They just had an election. Uh, uh, I rather like this, actually. Uh, I don't know who the artist is, but it's a gallery. Uh, Balinese artists, these are kind of, he cuts out, but these are all beautiful drawings around, it, almost like feeding on an empty lake. I don't know, that's how you see it, like, you know. There's no water left for the animals. This is a painting. Amazing, right? You think it's a sculpture, it's actually an oil painting. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, this is you know, an exhibition of a, uh, by a friend of mine who, who paints, who did a series, his name is Ari Hatanto. He painted a series of, of portraits of artists, but in fictitious background. And so she's a famous Dutch artist who did that burqa, the back here, the, 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 with, the, with the badges. So she's Dutch and she's lived in, in Indonesia for like 30 years, only speaks Indonesian. I think she's coming to talk as well, one of the, our lectures here. Uh, so this is a portrait of her in a kind of tropical setting, a bit surreal. Uh, but I, I, I think see, there's some, this is Alfie, uh, uh, who is uh, uh, another Indonesian artist. There's a Gunkunia one, another artist. So this is artist painting artists. And there's a long tradition of artists painting other artists in, in, in throughout history. These are the artists in black and the third and the left is the artist, the curator is one in, the, in white, and these are the art, three artists that was portrayed in the, in the portraits. This is another exhibition by a young girl uh, uh, in Chimati. Uh, uh, it's all about house and land, and she grew up basically, she remembered when she was in Jakarta growing in, in 1998 when there was the, Suharto was overthrown, how they had to move house 
uh, uh, and this is all about that, kind of going through her experience of moving at a very short notice moving, moving house. This is a, a, a Anki who, who, who makes works out of scanning. He's, this is not photograph, he scans, he takes pictures and scans them. And he now, one of the, in the most interesting project I, 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 I know of Indonesia now, he was arrested for drug possession, I think two, three years ago. And he stayed six months, he was locked up for six months in the prison. When he was there, he started an art project, which he continues to this day, now he's left. So there's this art, which is, I, I love stories like, you know, artists who, who made use of their time. Uh, uh, and so he, he's, I, he, I'm a huge fan. And this is not a young artist, very funny. Uh, they're great, great painting. You know, all, I mean, you can imagine a country of 250 million, they, uh, and each year there's a limited intake. You have to be very, very good to get into that school. So the essential skills are already there. The gift is already there. Oftentimes, the school teaches them how to think. That's really, you know, the, the skills are there. They came with their God-given gift already. It's a matter of how they use that gift to tell a story. Uh, 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 and this is one of those young artists. And he, he can particularly paint, repeat an old master painting, and then he kind of blurs the head off. Uh, I love this. It, it, it's, it's beautifully painted, small paintings, and he kind of adds things like, like that, you know. And this is one of the, the, one of the cheapest thing I bought. They're like uh, 400 ring, uh, no, 100, 400 US, no, 300 US a piece. So it's not all art expensive, yeah. This is another young artist who did a basic environment uh, installation uh, in the Jogja Biennale. Uh, but I, I found it a little bit kind of derivative. It reminds me of that English artist who does all this, what's his name, environment art as well. This is another artist who I follow much. Essentially, they do, they do puppets. Uh, they, work, they work on, uh, they have a theater, a puppet theater, where they, everything is handmade. And these, he, the guy who, who, who makes it, he, he actually does drawings or the portraits first. This is one of those things. That's the couple. There you are. End of talk. Thank you very much. I hope that wasn't too boring. <laughs> is that long? How long was that? One hour? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm going to do one hour. Okay, we're going to open the floor for questions. Are we interested to ask questions? Yes, Steve. Hi, I must congratulate you on a really good talk and uh, the curatorship of this uh, whole show is, is really you. striking. Uh, but I have one question to ask. Uh, there are z z virtually zero, zero abstract works, paintings. Mm -hmm. Is it because of uh, 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 it's not popular in Asia or is it because of you being uh, n not keen on uh, abstract paintings, or can you give me some insight into that? No, I think the, the, like I said at the beginning, this show was predicated on trying to uh, find, focus on certain issues that I think it will, 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 become, will become important over the years. I mean, chief among them was, like I said, environment and, 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 and you know, gender issues. So it's, this is, you know, we have, I mean, I have personally a lot of abstract work, I collect abstract work, I have nothing in abstract work, it just didn't fit into this show. They say, I would say, I, uh, like work by Kamin, those are abstract. And to some extent, Mi Chang is abstract. Maybe a, a wider definition of abstract, but definitely abstract, it's not figurative. Uh, perhaps more conceptual than, 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 than abstract, but still, it's abstract in its content. And I would say, you know, Tabachai's work is abstract. I know, I know what you mean, yeah. Latif and, and I, you know, also the other thing is I, 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 I'm a huge fan, and you know, I, I, I collect Latif and, and some of the great abstract collectors. I've just been very disappointed with what I see. That's a personal thing. So not that I, that's not the reason why they're not here, yeah. They just didn't fit into the, the, the ambit that we wanted to, in this show. 
I mean, the next show will show that from the collection will definitely include a lot more abstract work. Uh, but you know, still, I, you know, I, 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 there's not many work that kind of abstract. I think, yeah, it's not prejudice. I have not seen anything that kind of excites me that is particularly original. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Actually, one of the things I really started looking at is really comic strips as a popular medium. I think one of the saddest things with 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 contemporary art is the inability to tell a story. Like, you know, you want to connect, and one of the best ways to connect is to tell a story. And there's nothing better way than doing so, and do a comic strip. So there's two works that are essentially are comic strips. Uh, uh, it's not deep, it's not, you know, you can't write a 10,000 PhD word on it, but you know. Uh, yes, any question? Any other questions? Yes. Ah, sorry, microphone, yeah. Um, would you talk about the difference between collecting for yourself and then doing something for for Ilim? I mean, yeah. Well, the, the main one is budget, of course. Yeah, uh, uh, I have a very limited budget, uh, but an increasing feel of interest. So it's kind of, uh, uh, with Ilham, you know, I wouldn't say they are, you know, they they you know they, they have unlimited uh, 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 budget, but they have a bit more than me, and, and also they have more space, which I don't have. Uh, are, you, are you collecting for them on an ongoing basis, or is it just for this particular show? No, 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 for a long term, for a permanent collection. Okay. Permanent collection. So the idea is that you know, we will have uh, as a base uh, to do shows in the next 20, 30, even 100 years, and maybe sharing it with other museums, work with other museums, where we can pull our collection together to do a show that is, you know, relevant to the times and, 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 and you know, uh, yeah, the, within those parameters of Southeast Asia, uh, and then beyond Southeast Asia, women artists particularly. I'm going to completely forget about the West. Uh, not for any reason except for the fact that I think, you know, we must have, you know, we, we, my audience is Asian. My audience is, 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 is here. Any other questions? Does that answer your question? Sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that sometimes you're a bit naughty where you buy art pieces that are uh, solely because you think that it'll appreciate in the next five to ten years. So in a landscape as vast as, as Southeast Asia, what are the things that you look out for? for you, look, you want me to tell you what to buy? Yeah, well, you purposes. know, like what are the, the investment tips? You, I may have charged you for that. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's not rocket science, you know. You look at the, 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 the countries that are coming up, right? I mean, China is the obvious one. And, and if you look at China, you think, well, is the, what is the, the, the most Chinese art form that you know of? For me, it's calligraphy. Yeah? So you think, well, you know what? The Chinese are all into Western thing, doing this, thing. but there will come a time when they're going to say, I think it's beginning now, when they're saying, well, you know what? Our art is really ink. That's ours. It's always been ours, and we can tell it in so many different ways. It's not just ink. It can be a video of an ink. It can be a contemporary dance based on calligraphy. So, you know, my gut feeling is that I would look at ink as a thing that you want to kind of start looking at long-term investment. I mean, not because you understand or like it particularly, but I think, it, you know, that I look at kind of India is another country I look at. You know, growing middle class, the people who who, who sustained any market is the middle class of any country. Without the middle class, there is no art market. You want the very rich to buy the big masters, and then you want the middle class to be aspirate, as, to aspire to that level. So it's all, also aspirational. So you want, it's a kind of human nature. You got to understand that, you know. Uh, uh, but gone are the days where goldfish painting will, 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 will sell for very much now. So stay away from goldfish painting, but I think, you know, uh, 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 definitely ink is something I would consider. And Indian art, 
I think photography is hugely, hugely underpriced. Yeah, it's one of the most uh, uh, accessible medium of contemporary art. Because we all can take a photograph, so we can always tell what's a good photograph or not a good photograph. They are all experts. It also is cheap. They're easy to keep. Keep them in a drawer. Easy. You can change it. Buy an IKEA frame and change it. No, that's not because it is frame in a. I always say, art that is not seen is not art. If you are hanging on the wall, it doesn't serve any purpose in the storeroom. It can't work its magic in the store. I'm very guilty of that. I got lots of work in the store. One of the pleasures of doing this show is unpacking some of the works here and seeing them for the first time after 20 years that I bought them. And some of them are like broken and they're heartbroken. But then, you know, uh, come see, come see. Any other question? Ed? After your two weeks in Southeast New York? Yeah? Anything else? No? Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for sending me out. Thank you.